He's like a David Attenborough of reality TV. It's just like sitting, we see the gazelle being eaten alive. By <laughs> this the, is part of the circle of life. <laughs> we can't mourn the loss of the gazelle. We have to be compassionate for the lion's need for food. <laughs> yes. Welcome back to Dear Shandy, listeners. Andy. Ooh, exciting guest. <laughs> it's a very exciting guest. I'm like shaking with excitement. I know, I Jittery excitement. Mm-hmm. I just have so many questions and I don't even want to talk about the questions because then I'll take away time from actually asking them. We're joined today by the host of probably the only reality show that you and I can agree to watch. Yes. And enjoy it together. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't feel like a chore. Right. Like we look forward to it. We, we watch it live. Tonight. Tonight, we will be watching it. <laughs> right after this. We are joined today by Mark L. Wahlberg, the host of Temptation Island. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little uh, overwhelmed by that introduction. I didn't realize. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys watched the show. You are, you are now America's most beloved uh, reality show dating host. <laughs> that was a superlative I hoped to reach when I was in high school. That's, <laughs> that's very exciting. I think that this show is really um, the opposite of how a lot of dating reality shows are, which is to say, I think it's more of, I was thinking about this, more of a sheep in wolf's clothing versus the wolf in sheep's wolf in clothing. Sheep clothing. You yeah. know, it's funny you say that. I, I've been called out a lot to talk about this lately. And the show in, on the surface looks like it's this trashy, crazy reality show. And I don't think you expect it to have this sort of moral, you know, grind and grist that makes it really, really real. And uh, I love that. I love that it, it, it appears to be what you expect it to be. And then you get hooked in and it's, it's a bigger conversation. So my original claim to fame is I was on The Bachelor several years ago, like seven, eight years ago now. Back when it was great. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) The golden era. (laughs) The golden era, pre-social media taking over. Mm -hmm. However, it's just interesting to me how even when I have recommended Temptation Island to my, uh, I recap the show, so to my readers, uh, the response has, has been sort of mixed. Like people who actually give it a real go are hooked, but then others, they, they have this sort of gut reaction. People sort of get up in arms well, about I, the concept. I, I just say it is what it is. I, I say that, look, you know, if you're in a relationship and you've got issues with your relationship, there are qualified people in the privacy of your home or theirs to talk about this. But that said, if you choose to do this extreme experience, I actually do believe that there are some answers you're going to find. It's not scientific. It's not something I would suggest, but it's my, uh, you know, my personal commitment is look, and I say this to them, why do you want to come on the show? And then they give me a line of, you know, we want to find the answer to this, or I think he's that or that. And all that's true and part of it. But I also say, you also want to be famous and be on TV and it looks like it's a breeze and you're going to, you know, get you know, social media collabs and everything's going to be great. And all that's true too, right? Yes. But they're not mutually exclusive. So I'm like, whatever your reason for being here, you're here. And what's going to happen is absolutely real, even though you think you're going to be able to manage it. And so my commitment, I say to them is, you know, my commitment is to be real, honest, and an advocate for all eight of you to get something out of this that makes you happy or better. And I make a point to say all eight of you, not all four couples. You know? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Because it doesn't always perfect. end the way it begins, does it? No, that's for sure. Well, one thing I think is almost guaranteed, as long as a contestant seems sort of open to it, is this sort of self-growth factor. It's unbelievable to me how someone will kind of find themselves in that setting, alone, away from their partner. And it's quite inspiring, honestly. But to I get- find it interesting, too. It I- is. I do. I find it really interesting. And that's sort of like, you know, when I watch a show when it's on the air, I was talking about this with a friend of mine yesterday. When I watch it on the air, I can see it for what it is, a reality show. And it's bigger than life and extreme. And, you know, to some people might feel like professional wrestling or whatever. (laughs) But when we're doing the show and quite honestly, even after we do the show, it's very real to me 
and I take it very seriously. Right. And so the, I have no judgment of the people who are on the show and whatever they're grappling with and how they choose to grapple with or whatever mistakes they make. But what I'm always saying to them is, and this is, I think the life lesson is that as much as you'd like to have the problem be about the other person or some dynamic that has to do with the two of you in this situation, you don't get that opportunity to even entertain that. You have no control over this. All you can look at is your own shit. Pardon my language, right? <laughs> it's all you can look at. Yeah. But what I found in 33 years of marriage and 35 years of relationship with my wife, who's hiding over here and watching, mm -hmm. um, is that you don't have control over the other person. And the only thing you can do is look at your own, you know, blind spots and see if you become something else. And then at the end of the day, you find out that what you were in before, in fact, isn't fulfilling you or you were holding yourself back from really enjoying it and finding it. So that's kind of what my philosophy is. And that's what I'm trying to reinforce. And I, I was just going to add, you do in another life or maybe this life, you could be a great therapist. Yes. I mean, I'm so well, impressed. And you don't tell them what to do, which is what well, a good therapist is supposed to do. You bring it out of them better than the higher Anyone paid on television. don't tell you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You got to pay them extra to tell them to, for them to tell don't you. Don't you know that I've done my research there? Thank <laughs> you. Um, my wife and I have been married. I, I keep going back to her, uh, not because she's in the room uh, with a <laughs> knife threatening me, but but I keep going back to this. I met my wife very young. Okay, uh, twenty two, maybe twenty. 20, I was 23 when I met her and we got married right before my 25th birthday. And so we grew each other up. So she's also 35 years sober. Right. Okay. And in doing that, 37, 37 years, sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and in the process of living with somebody from that point of her sobriety and our own mental health, we kind of chose to have this conversation always going on in our house. Like we never kind of go, oh, everything's fine. Okay, it's fine. You go to the golf course and I'm going to go play gin with the girls. And that's not how it works in my house. So if, if something's not really firing, we talk about it. And my wife is constantly reading and learning from great teachers who are not MDs. They're, they're great teachers. And so that conversation has been going on in my house. So my emotional intelligence is by virtue of, you know, the boot camp of marriage – and not being, um, you know, complicit. You know, I, I, I want to know. I want to know why I'm a jerk, and I want to know why I'm having trouble communicating, and I want to know these things. So I've taken my own workshops. She's taken her workshops. Whatever she does, I do by virtue of living together. And so I guess what I'm getting at is I'm not a therapist by any means. Some people call me a coach. That's legit. Um, but most of the people that I have – gone to to teach me how to be emotionally intelligent and emotionally available uh, that my wife has introduced me to also don't have any PhD or MD or MSW at the end of their name. They just have life experience that mm -hmm. they've accumulated in research. And so, you know, the advantage I have on the show is that I'm older than them and <laughs> I've screwed it up more than they have. So, you know, I have more life experience. That's exactly so, what I always say. When people compare me to therapists, I'm grateful, but it's, yeah. it's really just life of us yeah. teaching ourselves how to grow up. Hundred percent, but you've done it well. You've learned, you've must have made a lot of mistakes to be that good. <laughs> yeah, well, on, you know, as a former self-obsessed codependent narcissist, I have made a few mistakes. But I, uh, I like now, the diagnosis. It's a highly evolved being that shows up for several minutes once a week. You're an empath. Oh, Robbie just said you're an empath. All right, that that's part of it too. So you are. Thank you, honey. I'm doing. Podcast. Do, do we get to see Robbie? Come here, say hello. Her make she does this every time. No makeup, hair's a mess, and then she yells at me. But I keep referring to her, and then here she goes. Yay! Hi, nice I to meet you. Much I look much prettier with my makeup. So, so do I. <laughs> so do I. And there. And Columbus. Oh, I hate you both. <laughs> <laughs> and it's spring. Yeah. It's beautiful here. Uh -huh. Not right. going to lie. It is it's nice. a quick sister. <laughs> He's an empath. Empath. Okay. I, keep keep I him in it. check. We got another hour. Keep him in check from the wing. <laughs> Maybe I'm in check. <laughs> you know, you sort of write it off as being, oh, I have life experience. I've made the mistakes. But I still think there's more to it than that. Like your, def your level of perception. And I'm not blowing smoke. I really no, am no, not. I think, 
And I'm not going to be falsely humble about it because that's obnoxious too. Yeah. You know, here's where it comes for me is that I'm a TV host and how to be a successful TV host is to be your most authentic self because mm -hmm. you're not playing a role, right? You have to be who you are because you play a role. It's empty and everybody gets that. So who I am is somebody absolutely interested in the progression and the transformation and growth of other people as well as my own. Okay. So on that note, because it is, I think it's very noticeable. I mean, there not an episode goes by where we're like, oh my God, he's amazing. Like you just will ask a question that's piercing and you'll hold someone to it, even if it's not what they want to hear. To quote an IMDb review, you add class to a show that could easily go in the direction of some brainless Jerry Springer trash. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that, that might sound kind of harsh, but I think it's Doesn't really it? true. Like, I think you single handedly keep this on the rails, on the rails and all and weirdly uplifting. It, mm -hmm. it becomes, like I said, this journey of self-discovery. And it people. tries so hard to go to the gutter, but it can never <laughs> do it because of you. It's Shame amazing. Mind. You're like a policeman. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, a protected surf. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> So, um, so thank I, you for your kind words, but let me just add a caveat that it's a team effort and the vibe of the show comes from all of us, including my two executive producers, Grafari and Dan, who are buying into there's something deeper than who bangs who. Mm. Um, and I think this really goes back to the original, original show back in 2001. So you got to remember this got bought by Mike Darnell, who's the king of reality over the top television back in the 90s and early 2000s and is still doing his thing. And um, I think that he got that what I was able to do was bring some humanity to something, because if I'm the guy wringing my hands going, I hope they cheat, I hope they cheat. <laughs> it's just gross. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's just not it. And so even when I did shows like Moment of Truth, which was a, a, a game show I did, which is all about a lie detector. If it was all about hearing the dirty, dirty stuff, it's just not as entertaining as the stuff that we can relate to, which is the grappling between, you know, in that case, what is what I think is true about me and what is actually true. And in this case, what we think our issues are and what we discover them to be. I'm enjoying that ride. And I agree with you. This this show could be a sleazy uh, dumpster fire more than it is if we didn't try to bring some actual touch point for anybody in a relationship. Andy. Hello. It's uh, ad time. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about today? We are talking about Grove Collaborative. Yes, we are, which is a pretty great service. It's very up our alley. It's very on brand for Dear Shandy. It is quite on brand. Yeah. Um, we're not the first to it. It's pretty, like, apparently 2 million households in America using this. Yes. Yeah. So we're, not, we're not pretending we have our finger yeah, on the pulse. Yeah, we didn't discover this, but <laughs> yeah. we love it. Yes. And it's great. You know, it's, they curate the non-toxic, eco-friendly, green household products. Natural that, products. Natural products. Mm -hmm. That is not, it's not that easy. To, you know, you're kind of struggling when you go to the store. You're it's struggling. true. You're just like, do I get this? Like, this, this is cheaper, but this is better. And I, it, this makes it easy. <laughs> And I like it. <laughs> well, it really is up our alley because it's cleaning products and we're both and quite neat. You're particularly germaphobe. Clean yep. Yes. And a germaphobe. And in pandemic times, we like our cleaning stuff and we go through a lot. Mm -hmm. They have an entire gardening section. Yep. My plants are very happy. And I think best of all, it's delivered to your door and you can set up a monthly subscription yeah. so that you get it on schedule. It's great. You, so it it's, just, you don't have to leave your home, you which leave we your also home. love. <laughs> and you could be more woke about the products you use. Yeah. And about the environment. Mm -hmm. really. Most importantly. Making the switch to natural products has never been easier. For a limited time, when Dear Shandy listeners go to grove.co slash shandy, you will get to choose a free gift with your first order of $30 or more. But you have to use the special code. So go to grove.co slash shandy for your exclusive offer. That's grove.co slash shandy. And, the, and, you know, we always talk about this, the stakes in this show, even though on the surface, it doesn't appear like there are real stakes. The stakes in this show are so much higher, higher than, than they are any the, other dating especially show. Especially The Bachelor. Not, yeah, well, I allowed to say well I mean, The Bachelor is an easy one to compare it to just but, because it's so iconic. But I, well, The I Bachelor came out of our show. That's Origin true, actually. Right. Originally, it was ABC's answer to our show on Fox was, let's try this. 
So, um, yeah, I get it. The comparison makes sense to make the comparison. But that's the irony is that The Bachelor is actually less. There's less at stake and it's kind of trashier in the end. Oh, I like I said, Island. it's a folio wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. That's exactly yeah. the right. Trojan horse, well, whatever you want to call it. I love that you guys have uh, taken your discussion of the show to bonfire level. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I'm quite impressed. But, uh, so you're pretty outspoken as the host, I think. I think you're pretty honest. You really say what you think. My question for you is, how do you balance your opinions without sort of pushing them too much? Like, that's got to be a delicate balance, especially when, like I said, the person you're talking to, it's usually a man, I'm just saying, but <laughs> well, doesn't necessarily want to hear what you want to hear. I'm a little rougher on the dudes than I am on the, on the women. Okay. Um, and I have a bias. I think that men are in general, a little bit emotionally less intelligent uh, by virtue of our privilege of being dudes. So I think that we have atrophied a lot of sensitivity and understanding as a species that um, shows up a lot. Uh, not all of us, and I'm gonna catch shit for generalizing, but <laughs> so know that I have a little bit of a bias and I'm a little bit more pro woman than man, unless the woman is acting in a way that's, you know, not good. So the balance is this. I really try, um, you know, when things get cut down, it looks like things happen and then I say something smart and then we move on. <laughs> and the truth is that five minute bonfire is an hour and a half, right? Yeah. And it's a conversation. And that's really what my goal is. So let's just have a conversation about what's going on with you, or what I'm sensing from you or what you're not talking about. And sometimes it took a very long time to crack the nut and get into that. So my opinion, I try to keep like my judgment really doesn't have a place here, although mm -hmm. it shows up on my face a lot. But my questions can be legit and I'm allowed to ask them. And most importantly, I feel like I have a responsibility to the viewer who's watching and screaming, how can you let him off the hook or her off the hook without asking those questions? And I really try to make the point to say, look, I'm not judging how you have sex or who you have it with or how many people you have it with and at what point in the journey you make those choices. I've learned enough that your sexuality and the choices you make, that's yours to keep and none in mind to judge. There's, as long as no one's getting hurt, I look at your empathy in it. Mm. And when that seems not able to reconcile with what we're trying to offer, I get a little nose out of joint that I'm not running a brothel here. That's not what this is. This is a journey. And if your journey is expressed actually cool, but I need some evidence in our conversation that you're actually going for an answer and not just going for, you know, to up your numbers. Tails. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, that shows up in every season and other issues show up that you've got the others who are like, you know, oftentimes, look, I'm just not going to cheat. And I'm like, OK, but there's really very little to gain from that. I think anyone, regardless of your libido, can sustain and be faithful for 30 days. You can run the gauntlet of not putting your parts in other parts for 30 days. Yes. That's not the same as why do you have this fracture in your relationship? And yes. so I think it's my job to call it out when it's not. You know, if I'm feeling that it's not settled, I'm going to say something. So even that, that feeling, you said, when I feel it's not settled, do you, do you have experience with any kind of like marriage or family therapy? Like what's your personal experience other than just having lived All it, right. like you said, Fair that to can add. allow you to pounce on that and think of it in the moment? That's a, I mean, I, again, it's, it sounds like we're really blowing smoke, but it's, it really is a unique ability to spot it in the moment and say and articulate it so well, is there anything other than your marriage that has yes, sort of given you that there is first i'll say this however the thing that we think we're hiding from the world is very evident to everyone else looking in at us <laughs> True. so the question i'm asking of anybody on the show which seems like to them that i'm i've discovered a nugget that's deep within them and in fact for most of us is what we're seeing you scream out at us Mm -hmm. And you're unaware of it, but we're not. As far as the coaching back and forth question and answer to dig deeper to find out the root of things, well, that's a very um, practiced um, journey that you find if you did like Tony Robbins or Landmark Education, uh, which used to be S, these 
what we call emotional intelligence or uh, transformational uh, work, right? So, and people write about it, Eckhart Tolle and, and, uh, and Deepak Chopra and, and uh, Brene Brown and, and all these people who play around the, the conversation about your true self as opposed to your ego or your pain body. It all has different words, but the, the workshops that I have been in as a student and have observed and spoken in as a teacher, there's a, a way of communicating, a, an inquiry where you are asking a question and you keep asking the coachee questions that make them look at things deeper than they had ever seen. Because what we're talking about is dealing with transformation, which is to find a new way of being out of a repeated way of being. You spent a whole life and you're here. And if I go to anybody and look at it, you're going to find that in your life, there are certain areas of your life that keep repeating and you can't seem to get out of the circle. You might get some advance, but you constantly keep repeating. And that's usually, and this is a traditional pop psychology, all these transformative work are in this line that until you look at what the, the pain was that happened when you were a child or somewhere there and complete on that, you're good destined to repeat the past as your future. Mm -hmm. And so what I, and my wife and I have coached on is how, how do we take those things that are painful or stop us or insecurities or blind spots, we call them in our lives, complete on them, or at least that we get aware of them so that we can have a different outcome and move forward. Right. And so the best way I describe it is like the movie, um, a beautiful mind. He doesn't really cure himself, but he recognizes that the visions don't age so he can separate what's fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. So it never goes away. Right. But he put a pin in it. Those guys aren't real, right? Yeah. And then he's able to go on. So that's kind of what I'm, where I've learned it is from my own experience, either being coached or coaching in that inquiry kind of conversation where the person comes up with the answer rather than being spoon fed to you. So that's why I say, you know, what do you think that pain's about? Why how does it make you feel? What's coming up for you? Because out of their mouths come things they didn't realize. You know, what we're seeing with uh, Kristen um, mm. is that she thought it was about him cheating, and it was. But what we're seeing is, in the last episode or two, is that she got to her not talking about the um, trauma of the loss of her brother mm -hmm. is a whole world of things stopping her, of feeling responsible and guilty and shamed and, and the pain of it. And so for her to step up and talk about that, you see – you see her transformation right there. You see her become lighter and, and, and other people are moved by it. It's true. And she actually, transformation really is the word because even as a viewer, that episode really did sort of change your perception of her. It explained, I mean, I can only imagine how difficult it was for her to finally reveal that, but it really did complete the You picture. could have aired that bonfire as its own episode. It was an hour and a half. And at one point she's saying, I just don't want to talk about these things. And I said, you know, I'm not going to push you, but I'm going to invite you that only when you talk about it are you going to be able to get complete on that. And she says, I really need to do that. And I said, well, do you want to practice now? Mm -hmm. She goes, uh-huh. <laughs> so I said, okay. And that's when I went over and sat with her, mm -hmm. right? It, it looks like I'm just like doing it for the show, but it was a really tender moment. I was really honored that she felt comfortable enough to open up. And I think a lot of people responded who were uh, Juwan. And the next scene is, uh, was it Juwan who was touched because he had lost somebody and that's how it works. That's what transformation looks like to me. It's interesting. The show kind of manufactures uh, like an artificial breakup. It's kind of it kind of brings to a head all the problems that haven't been sort of fleshed out in the relationship was there was no immediacy. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes when you have like a little bit of a separation or you, you, you either voluntarily or involuntarily have a separation in a relationship, you're like, oh, my God, I should have done this and I didn't do oh, that. Yeah. And I realized about this and she should have done that or he should have done this. And this is like it almost like a vaccine for <laughs> no. Uh, anyway. Or or, you know, yes, word. but I always I bring it back to a really tangible moment that we can all get. You know, if you're in middle school and you got a crush on somebody and that's going well, and then you're kind of like, I'm over her, totally over her, it's whatever. <laughs> and then, so you go walk down the hall to the locker and you go, okay, so I'm going to break up. And she goes, okay. And you go, okay, because that's basically the way the conversation goes. Mm -hmm. And then at lunch, you see her talking to another guy and all of a sudden you're flooded with how important she was to you. Yes. <laughs> right? That's the middle school version of it. But we don't appreciate what we have when we're in it. And it's really clouded by how we're feeling about ourselves and what we're projecting on the person. And when you separate, like the show forces you to do, which was not my bit, 
That wasn't my, I'd be happy to talk to them as couples. That'd be fine too. But when you separate, you're forced to be with you. Mm. And I got to tell you, we will take any distraction in the world, including our partner to keep us from looking at our own mirror because it's ugly and not fun to see your own shit. And so I like the fact that they separate and then they're stuck with themselves. Yeah. That was a good idea. Whoever it, thought it was that. a good idea. I was going to say without that. Mm. Yeah, it was. But I, I really want to take my hat off because the producers could make a choice to say, you know, host the show. You know, I've got an earpiece. They could say, I'm going to feed you questions. You ask the questions. Let's cut this. Get, get it down to time. You know, and you, we know where the story is. So just ask these questions. And that's not how it goes at all. And so I have to let you know that while um, I'm free to say what I want in those bonfires. And I also want to make sure you know it's not all me because Trafari's in my ear if I miss something, mm. right? But the freedom to let it breathe, in other words, to shoot for an hour and a half to get five minutes, yeah, that's the difference. Mm. And not a lot of shows will do that. Definitely not. I mean, it shows a level of trust. Mm-hmm. And actually, I did have a question that I want to circle back to. Was that something that you guys had planned or has mm. it sort of just evolved that way as it's gone on? So when we did the show originally, there was no plan and there was no reality TV to draw from. So we had this executive producer came up with the idea or bought it from somewhere else. I really don't know. And he was a heady dude like me, like really just about the experience. And everybody's like, (laughs) oh, God. Right. And so I was down for that. And and there was no communication. So we didn't have like, you know, an IFB, like earpiece and monitors and we were on the beach physically with an actual bonfire of kerosene so by the end of it we looked like raccoons we just have you know black all over <laughs> soot. but when we were doing it they let me do my thing so we'd have a briefing and they couldn't communicate to me while the bonfire was going on so i said look i said it this way what do you think what would you like me to find and if that's not there i'll get something else on the boat that we can have for dinner you know as we go fishing and we sort of went that way so the show came it went it was experience and it did well and then now they're going to reboot it and they call me and it's 18 years later so i went into the meeting like this is i i always say it was like morgan freeman and shawshank going into his parole meeting like i know what you think sonny but you know i was like (laughs) uh, so i wasn't even trying to get the job and i basically said look just so you're aware unlike a lot of shows that have come since this show needs a host so whoever you hire know that those bonfires and all that stuff, that was me doing my thing. So find somebody who knows how to do their thing is how I left that meeting. Mm. And um, thank good. God it was me. I, <laughs> it's just so great that they brought you back. It's, like, it's like the natural, like well, Robert Redford. <laughs> and it was stupid because the reason they did it was nostalgia, yeah. like to bring it through as a reboot. Mm. And then immediately we realized that no one watching the show remembers it from back oh. 2001 because they're all too young. So it's like, who's it? So that's when I became the Walmart Chris Harrison, you know, this knockoff of the bachelor guy <laughs> trying to do the bachelor's gig. And I'm like, it's not even worth the effort to try to straighten the record. It's uh-huh. all good, you know? Little did we know all this time that Chris Harrison is really a knockoff of you. <laughs> yes. You know, Chris is Chris and I'm me, but they definitely, I got a phone call from, one of the founding producers of, of The Bachelor. Um, and he said, I just left a meeting at ABC. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, we were talking about this new show, The Bachelor. And the president of ABC said, OK, let's talk about hosts. I want Mark Wahlberg. And I said, I held up my phone with your number. And he said, no, he's on Fox. we got to get somebody. Oh. <laughs> so, but I, you know, listen, I look like Chris. I had the same name as Mark Wahlberg, the actor. So I'm destined to be just confusing. So whatever. <laughs> Andy definitely wanted to talk about the name thing. But I was, he, I was we didn't say, want to be those people. Yeah, I was getting all my Mark Wahlberg jokes ready. But I, how annoying on a scale of one to ten are the Mark Wahlberg jokes at this point? Well, let's just say that some of my personal transformation has been grappling with that. <laughs> uh, it used to be really obnoxious. Like when I was promoting shows that I was doing, uh, before Temptation Island, and I'd have to do these radio interviews over and over and over again. And it seemed like the further down the market list we get, the more the the joke would come in to the point where, and you're doing radio, like every six minutes you got a new station. Mm-hmm. And at one point, the guy before I call on the air says, I'm going to make some Mark Wahlberg joke. And I said, look, <laughs> make your joke, but it better be good. <laughs> exactly. I've heard everyone, and if you're going to come at me, I'm coming right back at you. <laughs> I do this for a living. Yeah. Right. Ah. 
And so he makes some Boogie Nights joke, <laughs> and I just filleted him. I don't even. I'm like, that's why you're on the radio on Market 145 at three in the afternoon. Like, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time thinking of a great joke, and I realized I couldn't think of one good enough that yeah. you that, that it would fit. I, I was also really that. putting the yeah, damper I was like, on it. It would have to be the greatest joke I've ever thought of. I was of like, in my don't life. make that joke. I'm yeah, too embarrassed. No, I'm you can do it. I can't. You know no. what? Part of what I've had to come to, and I'm looking at Robbie because we totally get this. It's so ridiculous. It's just ridiculous, right? <laughs> that I have the same name as a famous guy. But the truth is this experience with this show for these three seasons we've done has been so positive that what it, I look at it from what it is in my life. So my life is I work for 35 days or so in Maui. <laughs> I bring my wife with me and I get to talk about transformation and love and stuff, which I love. Right. Like that's what we do as a hobby. So you can call me the other Mark Wahlberg. You can call me and Chris <laughs> Harrison knockoff. I don't give a shit what you call me because we are just the Happy. embodiment of gratitude over here at my house and nothing else really matters. I don't care what, I mean, all of us care, but my ego cares. But the truth is the real me doesn't really care what you think of me. And I'm glad that you're, you know, buying what I'm selling. We interrupt the scintillating conversation to bring you an important message. Go ahead. <laughs> you waiting for I'm the waiting. Message? I don't know what the message well, is. Well, we're just going to talk about the Hello Tushy bidet Oh, somewhere. the Hello Tushy, of course. I know. I actually get um, palpably excited when, when I've got a number two in the works. <laughs> I mean, I, I always, you know, have a little bit of it's a l- uplifting experience. Of course. Now, now that in more ways than one. Move. Yeah. But it's particularly so. Like I'm like I'm like oh wow I get to I know use the hello tushy again. I know what you mean. But I also I love that you use the word palpably. Oh, I was a little caught up on the palpably, but it's it. true that the hello tushy does renew your interest. Yeah, I don't know renew as though you ever had it and then lost it, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> the point is, is Mother's Day is coming up. Yes, and what better gift for your dear mother who who brought you into this world yes out of her body yes then the gift of of giving her something that will help her bring something else out of her body <laughs> is that too too much it's too much it's too much i don't know if it's too much it may be just the right amount it is kind of a funny gift but i actually think it's the kind of gift that people will actually use put it this way they'll they're going to use it and they may not even tell you how much they like it because they're ashamed of how much they like it <laughs> <laughs> because they're all going to like it an uncomfortable amount. On that note. Get yourself a Hello Tushy. One for you <laughs> and one for your mother. Yes. Give the gift of a clean butt. Go to hellotushy.com slash Shandy for 10% off plus free shipping. And once again, this is a special offer for our listeners. So go to hellotushy.com slash Shandy for 10% off. That's hellotushy.com slash Shandy. Okay, my... Sister's boyfriend would just never forgive me if I didn't ask you this. We might cut this. <laughs> he wants to know if you ever get called Dirk L. Diggler. You know, I, that's very clever. Oh, <laughs> oh. Whoa. <laughs> he's going to be very yeah, excited about Dirk that. Dirk L. Diggler. <laughs> uh, and no, but I, I love that. Okay. Wow. Apparently, I, that's uh, what he refers to you as. He's and be very it, I got to tell you something. That movie is brilliant. Brilliant. It's the best. The greatest. It makes me cringe all the time, but it, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And um, I added the L to my name somewhere in my career. I don't even know when. When I, and really was out of deference to his career. It was really not for me to go, hey, everyone. It was more like, this guy's a star. When you think Mark Wahlberg, that's who you're thinking. I'll be something else. It's not that deep. Right. So that's when I added the middle initial and I've been waiting for years to come up with what the L stands for. That's cool. And I, you know. Oh, so L is not oh, is not even. No, it is. It's oh. my middle name. Oh, okay. but I wanted to have some retort <laughs> and I don't I don't have it except that people now I've got a few Twitter fans that call me Mark Legend Wahlberg. So I'll take that. I like oh. that one. Okay, I have a few questions about the show itself now. Okay. Because Andy and I, we talk about, (laughs) I don't think a single couple watches Temptation Island and doesn't think, if we went on this show, we would do X, Y, Z or whatever. Do do you think the couples are always honest about their motivations for coming on the show? Or do you think that people, there are people who go on as a means of breaking up with their partner? Or on the flip side, this is like a swinger's wet dream, this show. (laughs) 
So they could make believe that they need to work in the relationship. And meanwhile, it's just like open season. I have a feeling those people. Well, first of all, is it redundant to call a swinger's wet dream? It should just be a swinger's dream. (laughs) (laughs) So let's clear that up just for matter. Um, Here's what I think. I could say all those ulterior motives are conscious and a choice. What I will say is that I believe that most of the people coming on the island thinking that they are being truthful. Mm. And maybe there's an agenda. Maybe there have been a few that think they're going to manage or job the system or whatever. And I say, fine with me. You know, come on and try to front. It's fine with me because it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I will find who you really are. You well, know, that's, as that's best why I can. it's such a good show. Well, that's what because- I was thinking. Sorry to interrupt, but I was I was wondering. Well, I was going to ask you, do you, how well do you? A two-part question. First, how well do you get... That's actually a three-part question. Maybe I should ask three questions. <laughs> how well do you get oh, to... Kn- you have <laughs> unlimited questions. Good. So you're going to answer three in a row. Don't forget any of them. Number one, how well do you get to know the contestants before you start filming? Do you want me to okay, ask all so three at once or just... No, go ahead. I'm taking notes. So let's okay. do it like a press conference. So, you know, all right, next one. <laughs> okay. Number two is... Um, do you have a preconceived notion as to what their deal is or where they're going to end up? Okay. And And the third question, you might forget one of these. The third question is, as we were just discussing, of the ones that you really know are there to try to game the system, how many times has that actually completely backfired and actually done the opposite opposite. to their relationship of what they expected? Okay. Which is nothing. The first part, which I've already forgotten. What was the first part? <laughs> I knew it. I should have asked. Yeah. Yeah. How, okay. How well do you get How well to know? do I know beforehand? Okay. This may be surprising. What's going on with them before you Here, them? Here's the deal. We went this year, we were at the resort in our room, uh, quarantined for seven days with nothing to do, Robbie and I, everybody, before we could even go out in the world. And I didn't even get a dossier or a picture of anybody on the show during those seven days. So the first time, I, I, at one point I got their Skype interview that they did with casting, the couples, never the singles. Mm. So I got that vibe of what they said their reasons were. Like everyone has an overarching theme. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you, Kel, uh, Chelsea and Tom is that he's too flirty. Aaron's like, I don't know if he's the alpha male. You know, those basic, uh, Julian cheated, I don't know if we're gonna commit, those things, right? So I saw those five minute videos, Skype videos that we watched a few days before it started. And then I met them all in real time when you see it on the beach. Oh, wow. wow. So I meet them for the first time and, and my background on them is, I mean, literally, I, I told you. And so, and no briefing with producers really at any level at that point. And they get off the boat and I shake their hand and then we walked to going to look at the villas. And while we were in the the like entryway of the villa waiting to shoot that walking in, I took myself a moment and I said, look, I just want to let you know before we get started that while it's all crazy and real and you've seen me on TV, so you think I'm somebody or whatever, I want to let you know that it's real for me and that my entire goal is for you to get out of this something that you feel good about, right? And and I said, but be clear, I want what's best for all eight of you. And I'm not saying each of the couples, right? Mm-hmm. And so I just want to let you know that this is real for me and that if I come at you, it's out of love. And that's basically how that goes down. And then okay. we go to the first dinner and sit down and talk. So so you really don't have a good feel for them. You, you have almost the same feel as we do as viewers. Almost, well, when it starts. Almost. Yes. I, I know what they tell me. With that opening dinner, and they uh, why are you here? And they say, well, I think he's flirty. And I go, really? And I, I start to go in there and go, because I'm picking up something else. It mm-hmm. can't just be that. And what's yeah. your past? And why is that triggering you? It's not what he did, but why is it a trigger? <laughs> that same guy could do this over here, and it won't be a problem. That's where we start. And, right. And so you do. I guess you do have a little bit of an edge over us then. So so leading to question number two, do you have some preconceived notions yourself as to what's going to end up happening with the couples? Uh, I know well enough to know that I shouldn't because I'm wrong every time with all my really? path and all that. Yeah, but, and, but now I know why. Uh, at first, I thought I was just a bad judge. The first like Shari and Javen in season one. <laughs> when she said, do we have a backup couple? They're not going to make it through the night. 
age, <laughs> right? And by the way, Javen may be one of my favorite people. He was and I only discovered that after the show when I saw how funny he is. Yeah. Because I also don't see anything that happens on the show because I only do the bonfires and I come in with bad news and I, I don't watch the stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think people are, are shocked to know that I don't know a lot of what's going on. The bonfire process is like this. Around six o'clock, Trafari or Dan, but usually Trafari, the, uh, one of my executive producers, comes in, sits with me, and we talk about where everybody is in the experience so far. Mm -hmm. Here's what's going on. Here's what we think. Here's what they're feeling. Here's what they said. And we go through a briefing of all eight people, and that's at 630. And then about nine o'clock, we start shooting. Wow. And that's it. That's literally, I don't write a note. I don't have any notes. She's in my ear. I said, if I forget, remind me. And I just try to get it. Like if, if it's somebody you care about, like if you go to lunch with your girlfriend and she says, I'm having problems at home and this is what's up. You don't have to take notes to remember that, mm -hmm. right? It's important. My trick, I guess, is that I am able to choose that it's important to me. So yeah. I access for me, this is important to me. So I'm paying attention. I'm present. I'm there. I'm with you. I'm with you. And that's how we do it. And then the third part of your question was. The third part was, was has there ever been a couple where most of the production staff kind of knew that they were trying to game the system for whatever reason, and it actually backfired for them? So that probably happens more than I'm aware of because I'm relatively insulated. Right. So I see them at the bonfire and we have our conversations. I see them at the date elimination or date selection or elimination or the dinner, but I don't really have casual time with them. And so I have said, I get a vibe that this isn't real, but the producers who work with them day in and day out may have discovered some people trying to game the system. But the truth is it's really not gameable. <laughs> because so the joke's on you if you try. <laughs> and I say this to them over and over. Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong. I say, look, if you try to manage how you look, you're going to look like shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All I can tell you is you can put off allowing this to be real. You can manage as long as you want. You can insulate. You can say things that you think are good, but your real self comes through whether you say it or not. Okay. What you're really feeling. Everyone knows except you. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you lean in, the more the audience will look. And that goes with the conversation of why are you here? And they'll say, love this, that, and the other. And I say, I think you're really here for followers. I think you're really here because your business is going to go crazy and you'll get verified. And God knows your life is better when you get a check on your name. Right. <laughs> and I say this, I said, but I got to let you know that the same outcome comes from being authentic. You have a chance with your relationship by being real and honest with yourself, and you're going to build a bigger audience by being real and honest with yourself. That's the key. No, everybody smells bullshit. It's so you true. can't manage this. Mm -hmm. We were just and, talking about this the other day. I was talking yeah. about how one of the lessons I think of anything, whenever you put yourself out there to the public eye in any capacity, whether that means go, having a podcast or going on reality yeah. TV, people really can smell bullshit from a mile away. Surprisingly so. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you don't realize it's bullshit until it's compared to something that's not bullshit. Yeah, very often. So when you see somebody phoning it in, especially my line of work, hosts, because I, I got to be honest with you, I produce as well sometimes. And when I'm producing concepts, I try to eliminate the role of host. If I can tell the story without a host, that's much better. So there are a lot of shows that have hosts or MCs that you don't really need to have a host or MC, right? And when you see people playing that role and then you see somebody authentically is that being mm -hmm. then you get the difference the weight of it right yeah. i learned that from antiques roadshow antiques that are authentic have weight there's something about it you can't put a finger on it but you can tell the difference between something real and ikea you can just tell yeah and i say that to the cast the sooner that you get real even though it looks vulnerable to you or you feel exposed is how you relate, how people love you. We all know that you're flawed. We all know that we're flawed. Mm -hmm. But when you pretend that you're not flawed and we see your flaws, then we feel like you're bullshitting us and that feels like a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no one likes feeling like the person's trying to dupe them. Yeah, right. well, I always feel duped. Like after we did the reunion, 
because I buy everything. Like it's all real to me. Yeah. Right. And then I remember the season two reunion special. My wife was out of town. My daughter was out of town. All the people that give me sanity were gone. So I had to go to tape and come home to an empty house by myself. And I don't like confrontation, which is also ironic that I should have the moment of truth and this show. And I end up with these shows that are all confrontation. So we do this, the reunion show with KB, you know, I, I'm the captain now, that guy. And, yeah. and all this drama and David and oh, all this stuff. And I went home saying, I failed as a host. I have failed. Look at all the things we talked about and how they forgot and it's all changed. And I, I feel like I've crushed them and it's terrible. And then my daughter says, Dad, have you ever seen a reunion show? I'm like, no, it's dreadful. <laughs> and she sends me a picture of all of them after the show at the club party and at the VIP room. Yeah. So I get that I take it more seriously than a lot of them do because they're younger. But yeah. that's the only way I know how to do it, you know? Yeah. No, and, and it really reads. It really does. Right. Back to the bonfire. How Do you know what clips they're about to see? So that's often asked, and I choose not to look at them beforehand so that I can honestly say to them, I haven't seen the clips. Okay. Now, in full truth, um, they're cutting them. My dressing room is one part of a room, and they're cutting them in a different part of that same building. So I get an idea. Like, mm -hmm. it was not a shock to me that there was, you know, Kendall slept yeah. with the because we all talk about it, but I hadn't watched the clip and what they're going to see. Okay. Right. And I try not to. So they say he's going to she's going to see something really bad. She's going to see Kendall with this one. But I don't actually see the footage so that I can say I don't want to project to them. Hmm. I don't want to go and say, let's check out this footage. Boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and that's really hard for me. That's Andy at the end of an episode when clearly there's not enough time to get to all four. And yeah. he's like, oh, it's going to end with so and so. Like, oh, Erica's going to be last. It's going to be yeah. bad. You never want to be the anchor on Temptation Island bonfires. That's that's a bad also, place to be. I also forget how dramatic it is for them. Like, I'm in a relationship with them. So I feel like I'm so happy to see them at bonfire after not seeing them for a couple of days. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, I dread the bonfires because it's deep, but I'm really happy to see them. Yeah. And I realize that they're not as happy to see me. <laughs> yeah, it's way happier for you, Mark, than it is for them. <laughs> yeah. But I really am grateful for the intimacy they give me. I mean, there are lots of hugs from the guys. And, and I, I try to refrain from hugging uh, out of my new respect for, you know, space mm -hmm. that we're learning, you yeah. know, through all the Me Too stuff. But it's my, my tendency. I just... And we had to do pickups all the time because they shoot the intros of them walking in a few times to get the angles because we don't want to break the vibe once we start. Mm -hmm. And we have to reshoot them a lot because they come in and bro hug me and we have to not do that. And it's awkward when they walk by and we're like, hey, you know, <laughs> I just want to embrace them and hold their hands and go and both the boys and the girls. And how are you? Like, how are you for real? <laughs> OK, what would you say are the best characteristics to have as a contestant on this show? Like what produces the best result? And then conversely, what would you say are more frustrating characteristics? Well, I don't know if it's the show as much as life. <laughs> so I would say that the best qualities are transparency and willingness, vulnerability and bravery. Yeah. Uh, the courage to just lay it out there, the willingness to take coaching or be aware that you're not perfect, which is yeah. a hard thing for most of us to swallow, to stay on your side of the street is a hard thing for people to do, but it's really, really refreshing. What I mean is to look at things not through what they've done to you, or what, you, but your responsibility in it, which is not blame, but, you know, there's things that happen and there's what we project on those things and how we feel about it, which often has very little to do with what happened and has more to do with what we bring to the relationship we hear over and over again. So the best people are the ones that are willing to admit that they've got baggage and drama, that it may be affecting it and willing to admit that they don't know everything yet. Mm. Right. And it may not all be the other person's fault. And then the worst are the ones who either are shut down for their own personal reason it's not malicious, unwilling, unable to hear criticism or a different perspective. And the ones that are trying to manage a perception or act. And but I don't really worry about that because that part of it can only be managed so long. And I'm key. I'm, I'm hip to it. Like you're not fooling me. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, at some point I literally say, you know, I'm going to let you front for a while. And, but I did it, you know, in season two with Nicole and they were at the final bonfire and she's like, I think I'm going to go back with them. And I'm like, I just don't feel like that's honest. Yeah. I, oh, that was such a great moment. Mm-hmm. I don't feel mm-hmm. comfortable letting, and, and by the way, that was us agreeing. So it wasn't hundred percent me, but I, but, but the truth of it was, Gosh, you know, I'm watching this like everybody else at home, and I don't think we feel like you really are being true to yourself. Yeah. And you may come to the same outcome, but I need you to sit down and convince me that this is legit, mm-hmm. right? Instead of just like, let's get the dentist appointment over with. Mm-hmm. And to be told, I feel good about that, and I feel even better about that they're together and really happy right now. Yeah. Which was not the outcome on the show, which I also say, the show ends, but this this experience doesn't. We're just out of episodes. It keeps going. It's fluid. I want to know, do you have or do you pick favorites? I feel like it's impossible that you wouldn't. Oh, I, you know, I I call it dadding out. <laughs> like I, all of them become my, it used to be my little sisters and brothers, but now oh. I like to call it dad instead of creepy uncle. So um, <laughs> that's the vibe. So I, I got to be honest with you. Um, on the girls side, every season, I, I fall in love with all four of them. Mm. Father, daughter love, not, you know what yeah. I mean? It, yeah. But I, I have a deep love for them because they immediately project as my daughter and, or my niece or something, or my cousin. It doesn't really matter. I, I have such an affection and the guys, you know, it's really interesting, a dance. I want their approval. So that's my own blind spot. I want them to say, Oh, he's a cool guy. And I have to kind of, <laughs> win some respect early in that so that I can get into the work, which is I'm going to have to not be a cool guy. And I'm going to have to mm-hmm. hopefully find a place that you understand where I'm coming from. And I understand where you're coming from. So that when I come at you, you don't feel attacked because there's no benefit. I mean, there's television benefit. If I come at Kendall and go, what the fuck dude, you know, which is what everybody wants me to say. Everyone wants you to do that. Yes. <laughs> but that's, not for me to say mm. I have a responsibility is to call things out that don't feel right. Like I have to say, I, I question your empathy. You're saying one thing and doing something else. I said to David in season two, you're yeah, saying like, one thing and doing something else. So it's confusing for me. Explain it. Yes. And it's like, uh, he's like a David Attenborough of reality TV. It's just like sitting, we see the gazelle being eaten alive. By this the, is part of the circle of life. <laughs> we can't, Mourn the loss of the gazelle. We have to be compassionate for the lion's need for food. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> uh, you know what it is? It's about compassion. And I don't want to give anything away, but in the reunion show, we're sitting there and it's late, late, and it's long. And Kendall and others, and it got like this, and he was doing his thing, which is, it's all good. You know, whatever. You know, you're all dysfunctional and wounded. And I took a minute and I said to him, I'm really blowing it by telling you this, but they'll probably cut it out of the show, so don't worry about it. So I looked at him and I said, you know what? I got to stop right now. And I got to say to you, Kendall, that I think I may have failed you. And he mm. looked at me and I said, because you're talking about these wounded women, but I wonder what wound you're harboring that I didn't explore. Mm. And I oh, got to yes. let you know that regardless of what's going on here, I have compassion for you. Like a father would for a son. I have compassion for whatever pain allows you to compartmentalize emotion at the level that you're doing it to protect yourself. And I'm available to you to talk about it well beyond this taping if you want my phone number. Uh. And he got really quiet and maybe choked up or maybe I was bullshitted, but I don't know. So. Oh, I would cry. I would that, lose it. <laughs> especially if you had such buried demons like Kendall. Yeah, he, well, but we, we all have buried demons. <laughs> yeah, but Kendall's got worse ones. <laughs> mm, maybe he's maybe maybe if we're if there's such a thing as better or worse, which I don't believe. Bigger? I just his <laughs> bigger demons. His his whatever his hurt is is actualized in a way that triggers all of us. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and that's really what it's about is how do you feel about it? It's not about the judgment. And I make that really clear, but I guess getting back to what I'm saying to you is the favorites or not, the girls are easier for me to want to cuddle, mm-hmm. but the guys, I, I want to father a little bit because I think that a lot of male toxicity and things like that comes from the lack of 
calling that out. And I've learned from some really great dads around me and, and, and stuff like that. So I have an effect. I guess what I'm getting at is I have deep affection for all of them. Even the ones that hate me, even the ones that I'm coming at hard and yeah. two, there are some of the guys probably won't even talk to me again, but I have a lot of love for them still. So yeah, maybe I'm just, maybe it, I'm the desperate and needy one. Maybe I'm the one who needs the bonfire. Uh Oh, this is not where this was supposed to go. <laughs> it's okay. self exploration is good. Okay. So half of our podcast is relationship advice. So people, you know, our angle is we're a happily married couple, write in your question or call in and we're going to be brutally honest with you. And we both, we both dated a ton before we met each other, that kind of thing. Well, cause and- you're both adorable. Oh, <laughs> Mark. Oh, Mark. <laughs> So, and that's why he's such a good host. I know. <laughs> well, we often say, you know, if someone's calling in and they're sort of downplaying the issue, we're like, well, you did write into a podcast. You know, that's sort of the elephant in the room. So, do you think that same logic could apply to Temptation Island? If a couple you make a is very as- good point, I think that people subconsciously join up to do Moment of Truth. It was a better example that show I did back in the day, but. I think you make a great point that I think people subconsciously put themselves in harm's way by saying, I want to do this show to force them to do what they're afraid to do intimately at their coffee table. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how would this work in real life? You might sit down with your, your boyfriend or girlfriend and go, you know what? This isn't firing on all pistons. We have a problem. Let's talk about it. Let's get some help. But that's bigger than a lot of people can handle. So what we'll do is we'll go on this TV show and not worry about it right now. And the show is going to force us to do this. Right. right? And I think that's a subconscious choice. And you make the very good point. You call them the podcast. So there must be something behind wanting to talk about this. And I'm not going to judge that it's more comfortable. You know, for some people, it's easier to be intimate with millions of people than with one person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I have that. I can get in front of an audience of a thousand people. I can be intimate immediately with them. That's comfortable for me. But oftentimes with my own wife in our own house, with the things that matter, I shut down the intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's scary to me. So I think there is an element that a lot of people are like, you know, it's it's like throwing your hat over the wall. It's like, I can't get it back. Now now I'm in. So I think you're right. I think that's a, a big Conscious and subconscious thing that people do. I think I think nine out of ten conservatively of the relationships that go on Temptation Island are broken in their current form. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily broken, but the way they are doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And I think the show brings that out at le- by the vast majority. I do, and I think broken often- may be harsh, but discontent and un- upset and uneasy and and incomplete. All of those feelings of right uh, stop yeah. you from moving forward, and they can. You know, it's gradiated a, a scale of really horrible stuff to minor inconveniences. And, and what happens is you kind of identify the things that are just, you know, things don't nag you when you're feeling good about yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're adorable. And then when you feel bad about yourself, those little adorable idiosyncrasies are fucking obnoxious, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think that's the process. That's what happens is that you separate, you remember who you are a little bit, and then you see things through a different filter. Yeah. Stagnant to broken is what I meant to say. Not all broken. <laughs> Backpedaling there. Yeah, yeah. A little too simple. But I, I got to tell you that I, your dynamic, the two of you, seems really, um, really comfortable. And I watch how you look at each other while you're talking. And it's, uh, I don't know, you got a vibe that's really peaceful. And huh. you listen while she's talking and you smile when he's talking. And, and it, there's, a lot, it, there's a lot that people say without saying it's just we all should listen closer to this. So we're telling everybody everything all the time. Mm-hmm. Could we? Can we own a Mark Wahlberg? I know. I want a Mark. I want one over here. L Wahlberg. A, you have a pillow. With Always his face on the couch. On <laughs> <laughs> My um, wife, though, you know, Robbie, and I got to be honest with you. This is a phrase that we saw on some podcast that I think it was Deepak or something that refers to an Upa guru, which is a phrase I don't even know what it means, but we think it means that we are each other's guru, right? Yeah. We're our best teachers. We are each other's best teachers. But, um, you know, I look at her the same way you guys look at each other. And then I'm I also can hear myself through, like 
<laughs> Robbie going, okay, now he's just full of shit and talking because he wants to hear himself talk. <laughs> so, you know, you, you got to have that to bounce off of. You got to have a, a place that knows all of your bullshit to be not full of shit all the time. It's so true, but also mm-hmm. a place where you are still respected. Like, I think it's, we talk a lot about like respect. Like if someone writes in, they're like, I just don't respect him anymore. I'm like, I don't love the sound of that because someone who can recognize and call you out on said bullshit, but also still thinks you're funny, smart, all the things. And it's not going to leave. Yeah. And and not going to leave. Like going to stick it out and fight it out like a, like a, like a a warrior. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no fear or drama around either of us leaving ever. See, it's a very important thing. That's what we say all the time. Uh, Robbie doesn't like this this little pitch I make. <laughs> so people say, "What's the success of your marriage?" Robbie says the answer should be because we love each other, which, by the way, is the right answer, <laughs> and it's true. But I get heady, and I say, "Love is always there, but fluctuates. It's fluid. Lust comes and goes. Like mm-hmm. is like." By the minute it changes, Mm -hmm. right? But what I've accessed in my relationship is need, defined as cease to exist without. So whether I like it or not, it's not even romantic. Whether I like her or anything, I know that in the dark hours of scary life things, there's only one comfort for me. Like if I go to the doctor and they go, oh, we found something and we'll know on Tuesday and I'm freaking out for four days, there's only one person I want to talk to. Mm. Right. Yep. And when you realize that it allows you to say neither of us is leaving. So when things are are rough, we can yell, we can scream, we can say things we don't mean. We could go there knowing that neither one's walking out the door. So you get to be the real you with all the works. And that's the only, and, and if you can't do that in your home, then you're Where in else? a relationship. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's a hundred percent the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, aside from actually liking each other, yeah. enjoying spending time with each other, yeah, <laughs> yeah. knowing well, that the other person is 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 there always, mm-hmm. and not yeah. in a way where they're like furniture, where you're, you're you take it for granted. Where you're like, yeah, you're not going anywhere. You yeah, can't just find in a better. way that does not induce walking on eggshells. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. You got to get the eggshells out. You got to eggshells. Got to go hard in your home, and then you can go out in the world and and pretend to be awesome. Like Robbie, <laughs> Robbie says to me, you know, TV's Mark Wahlberg is adorable. The guy who's been on my couch for the past three months, not so cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. I, again, we could continue, but I'm going to try to respect your time and we're going to close with one question. I'm not sure I'm done. Oh, really? Do you want to? No, no, I mean, go. I don't want to promise still... one more question if there's going to no, be No, don't promise more. anything. Don't promise, Mark. Okay. There could be 10 more questions, but okay. this could be the last one. Okay. okay. This could be the last question. Could be. Okay. You never know. If you could dispel one myth about Temptation Island, what would it be? Hmm. Okay. Well, there's several. One is... No one's wringing their hands, hoping for people's pain. That, that's good. And that's, that's, that's unlike other shows, I think. Well, they may, there may be some of that within the producing world, but from my seat, there is no pleasure or joy from the pain of others. Mm. There's no fear in going to that pain, but that's not where the joy comes from. And, and I want to just offshoot that. Other shows, which will remain nameless, I believe, try to push the drama. They really, yes. they instigate. So Absolutely. Are you I mean, kidding? I, that, yes. I'm not, that's not, everyone knows. We, that. we I mean, all instigate. Look, those toga but, parties and uh, and uh, anything but clothes parties, they come from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, the costume parties, we were wondering I, about that. But, yeah, but, but your point, I have heard the producers say many times, just tell the story that they're telling. Right. Just tell what's happening. You don't have to, on our show... You don't have to create shit. Because the, the concept is ma- already so far beyond. Exactly. Right. The like, concept makes it, it makes it already. The, it's already, oh, sorry. You no, you're something? right. I'm agreeing. Oh, this okay. is my I'm agreeing. What the myths to dispel, Rob? What do you, people think? Well, first of all, they think that anything that I say that is wise, that was scripted and I had nothing to do with it. But any decision that the show makes, I made. <laughs> Neither is true. I'm not a producer on the show, so I have no idea how things happen. And most of the stuff I say is out of my mouth. So that myth. I guess I just find that mentality so frustrating. It's 
it just sometimes feels like people automatically go to whatever the opposite of the benefit of the doubt is. Yeah, everybody feels powerful when they can judge things. Yeah, everybody feels better about themselves when they can say, "Hey, let me tell you about that." Mm-hmm. And I, by the way, I can tell you this because I'm that guy. My one of my biggest flaws is having to be right. I have to constantly check myself on having to say, "Well, no, actually," like that phrase. Bad news. So I think everybody takes that stance of, oh, that's all bullshit. Or I can tell you that that's not how it went. It's like going to see a magic show and going, yeah, it's up his sleeve with a spring, you know? <laughs> that's so, you. <laughs> yeah, I'm the worst. I'm well, like, but it's magic. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> aren't you afraid of the evil spirits? <laughs> I cannot tell you how much joy you've brought us in this little apartment of ours. And you will continue to bring us joy with your show. <laughs> I, I may bring you some joy within an hour and a half or two hours of, of this time right now. Yes, you You're will. about to, you are going to bring us joy. Yeah. In exactly two hours and uh, 42 minutes. So let me just say to you two that this has been delightful and oh. thank you for all the kind words. And I'm, I'm a little, you know, overwhelmed by it. And I love the way you guys do this. And I've sat through many podcasts where I thought to myself, you know, maybe they should find another job. But you guys are really oh, great. Wow. And, and thank you thank for all you. the kind words that you've said. And and um, next time we're in New York, we can we could be two couples in show business that are still married having a coffee together. And that may like be something that's never happened. That's the show. That's a show. It really is. A very boring show is what that is. <laughs> it would probably be boring, yes. Blissful married couples having coffee. <laughs> <laughs> You never know. know. (laughs) Anyway, we look forward to that day. That sounds fantastic. You were just such, we had high expectations, but man, you just really exceeded all of them. Thank you so much for coming on and just being just so fun. Everyone needs a Mark Wahlberg, I've decided. Yes. Well, apparently there's not enough of you. There's to choose from, so pick (laughs) the spelling make sure you get the one you want. You're a little more accessible, as we find. I am, yeah, obnoxiously accessible. Accessible. Robbie's told me I don't have to respond to every single Twitter comment, <laughs> but I feel as though I should. So that's what I'm doing tonight. Hey, you guys, thanks. Thank I, you thank so you much. So much. Okay. Now, just so you're aware, now what will happen is for the next 10 minutes, I'll go through everything that I said on this podcast that I said, I would say to myself, what was I thinking? Well, how did I say that out loud? So, and those are going to be the only things we leave in when we cut it. That's what I've had to accept. All it's right. just going to be. It's going to be Mark Wahlberg loves to cuddle the female um, contestants. <laughs> right. Read That's on. exactly right. Mark Wahlberg thinks he knows everything and just wants to cuddle inappropriate. <laughs> That's it. All right, we will set you free, Mark. Thank you so much. Bye, Good Robbie. Morning. Thank you. We know you're in the background. Robbie, say goodbye. Bye, bye. Bye. So nice meeting Ooh, you. Nice to meet you. Have a good night. I'll see you. We'll see you in a couple hours. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That's Man. Good he's he, good. He is good. I, I got to say, part of me melted when he was like, you guys have a good thing going. So I was nice. like, Mark Wahlberg. I was like, there's no one in the world who could give me better affirmation than Mark Wahlberg. I genuinely, like, honestly, if Chris Harrison said that, I'd be like, it's, I don't want to be a dick. <laughs> the way we're like diminishing <laughs> Chris Harrison's value and telling us we have a great relationship. <laughs> yeah, he's the second best. But it's just he really is so good with relationships. Like, great. look at his own marriage and, yeah. the, and the things he spots in in the relationships on this show. It just it means a lot coming from him. Yeah. You know, and I don't he, believe he would just say that if he didn't mean it. Sort of like us blow, uh, blowing all the smoke. We really did mean everything we I said. I believe everything he says. Yeah, I believe he speaks truth. Almost to a fault. Like, I really relate to that. He kind of, like, gets excited and he's, mm-hmm. and he's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this. And then later on, he's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Like, that's 100% me. And you have a bit of that, too. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's so endearing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's great. It's so funny that he's like, I remember when you kept telling me about this show and and as you can imagine, I was reticent. I was just like, uh, yeah, it looks really trashy. Looks and really I remember trash. for the first like the first time you sat me down, like, I have to watch this show. I sat down like the first five, 10 minutes. I was like, like, who did I marry? Like, why <laughs> is this a show she wants me to watch? And now it's like it's I can see why this is his show. Yes, it really is a real show. It's, it's the only real, real 
reality show that I've ever seen that I really feel has stakes and has real outcomes, whether or not the people go on the show with, as we said, the pure intentions. Yeah, p- exactly. Pure intentions, whether or not it the doesn't right matter reasons. because they are put through the gauntlet. They, no matter what you think you're doing, mm-hmm. you're going to end up where the show wants you to end up. Not, not, not in, you know, some artificial yeah, it, way like that. Your relationship is going to end up where it should end up because of what the show has done. Yeah, the the format of the show makes itself. They don't need to hide a bottle of champagne and manufacture drama because it's already dramatic. The concept is dramatic. And it's so interesting because you say that, who did I marry? Because when I recommended this to my readers, the reaction was really mixed. Like, I was sort of shocked, honestly. Like, I had some people saying, I can't believe you... Like, I gave it five minutes. I can't believe you watched this and would recommend it. Like, I see you differently. This yeah. is after I've been writing for six years. I was just like, wow. Like, I guess this show does not give a good first impression. No. But I challenge anyone to get to the end. This is mm-hmm. important. It's, you know, it's easy to cast judgment on the first five minutes. But get to the end of, you know, season one or season two of the reboot and tell me that it didn't end up being kind of a bizarre and yeah. unexpected story of self-discovery, oftentimes for the women and self-worth. And oftentimes they've found each, they found themselves individually to become better partners for each other. It's underrated. Like I said, sheep in wolf's yeah. clothing. It's real. You are forced into a real situation, whether you like it or not. And no one else does that. And it's great. Like he said, it's not gameable. Yeah. Unlike The Bachelor. The Bachelor is the most gameable thing ever. It's the most oh, gameable yeah, show. Yeah. It's most usually gamed. It's most it's quite usually, well, yes. actually. A lot of people have done very well. <laughs> <laughs> very well. Yeah. It's very gameable and there's quite a high reward for gaming. And gaming is not difficult. So you just sort of get a bunch of people gaming it. Which yes. I don't know about you, but it gets repetitive. And and I and I would like to add, we are uh, Temptation Island has not sponsored us in any way. <laughs> I know. Although, <laughs> although, if you're listening, Temptation <laughs> Island, we would love yes <laughs> to be sponsored by you. I mean, we do like to promote things we believe in. I have one other thing I want to mention, and that is that I really it's one of the more co-ed friendly shows. Can I say that? Mm-hmm. I have a hard time getting you to watch more than five minutes of The Bachelor with me or whenever I want to watch any kind of reality, whatever. It is something that I think couples, regardless of gender, mm-hmm. enjoy. You know, it's not like one it's person's convincing the other. It's a great couple show. Yeah. And and if you are having trouble with your relationship, it might be good too. Yeah. Might, might You might actually get some sort of like, you know, like um, contact high from the show. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hmm? Very good. Does that work? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I I laughed. Yeah, that I mean, you laugh at a lot of things I say. But you're just so funny. Uh. All right, I think we can wrap there. Yeah. Uh, if you guys enjoyed what you heard today, you can keep Dear Shandy in business by liking, subscribing, following us on Instagram, leaving iTunes reviews and ratings, telling your friends, telling your friends, all your friends, and not just your friends, like acquaintances and people you don't really like that much. Everyone. Everyone. And on that note, I think we can wrap. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Dear Shandy, and we'll see you next time. Bye.